Amen. What about that worship today? Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Well, you get to clap, and let's just give them a hand. <laughs> I just hate to give somebody a partial applause, so let's just go all the way. No, that was a great job. Thank you. Uh, we thank our ladies for uh, leading us in worship now while we're uh, in transition, and we appreciate what they're doing, and we thank the Lord for it. And uh, I, love, uh, I love those hymns, Here I Raise My Ebenezer, Hither by God's Help I've Come. And uh, folks, we stand today here as products of God's grace, on the merits of God's grace, and we thank the Lord. Well, it's great to be here today, and uh, we're looking forward to what God is going to do through His Word. And turn with us to the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. And we're in Nehemiah, and we're talking uh, a lot lately about rebuilding and coming back to the foundations and doing the work of God afresh in a new day. And, and, uh, and so we're very excited about that. We're very excited about what God's doing in our church. And we're trying to set a tone for rebuilding and coming back to the first principles and doing again what God would call us to do. And, and so um, we thank the Lord for that. And uh, we thank God for our decor team. And they're working to beautify our entryway and, and to make things uh, conducive to guests and, and just, uh, I love the kingdom vision that the Lord is birthing in our people and we want to continue that. We want to continue to reach out. We want to continue to be faithful to the Great Commission and to the gospel, to our community, and we want to be faithful to the gospel of the cross. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, I want to, I want to introduce some special guests. Uh, we've, uh, Katrina and I have been blessed to spend the weekend with my parents. Uh, stand up, if you will. I'm gonna, I'm gonna point you out. David and Flossie Humphrey. These are my parents. So, uh, if you've, if you've not met them, you can, you can meet them later. And, uh, and if you, uh, you can either thank them or blame them that I'm your pastor, but, uh, you know, that I'm here, but you can, you may do that. So we just thank the Lord for them being here. It's been a blessing to be able to spend time with them. Uh, and thank, thankful they're here today. Well, here in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, we, we looked at the first part of chapter 4 last week, and we saw that as the walls began to be rebuilt, and as Nehemiah was leading his people, God's people, to do a fresh work in a new day, what happened? The enemy reared its wicked head and began to assail the people of God and to attempt to forestall the work of God. And we know we have one enemy and his name is Satan and he commands countless uh, minions and devils and demons to assail and to work against the work of the church. And we see this in Nehemiah. So last week we saw that the Jerusalem wall, they've been building, and as we're going to see as we go forward, this wall is being built at a rapid, supernatural even pace. The wall is being completed. God is giving His people great success. And now the wall has reached the halfway point. It's reached the halfway point. You're so far in, there's no sense stopping now. But the enemies of the Jews are not happy. They see that work is being done. They see that the name of God is being honored, and they're not happy. So Sam Ballot and Tobiah, they've slandered, they've insulted, they've spoken words to discourage the builders and to try to dishearten those doing the work. And some of them have become disheartened. Furthermore, they've enlisted other enemy nations, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, and they've made plans to come to Jerusalem and attack it. So we've gone, if you've watched the progression of these enemies, we've gone from just, uh, you know, anger and resentment toward spoken words of discouragement towards plans of attack. And you see how the enemy is escalating his plot as the work of God continues and progresses. And I'm telling you, the, the opposition of the devil will always be equal to will be equal to the advances of the kingdom. And so if you don't want to make an enemy of the devil, don't do anything for God. That's pretty simple. 
So here we go, and these nations are plotting to come, and they've, they've sown seeds of discouragement, they've caused confusion, and now Nehemiah leads his people to respond. And we're going to begin with verse 10, and the first thing I want you to see from the text today is that we should not become immobilized by discouragement. Read with me here in verse 10 and following. In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. And so I want you to see here that there's three points of opposition that are coming against the Jews. Three unique points. Number one, the workers are being infected with unbelief. The workers are saying, we can't do this. It's not going to happen. And then secondly, the enemy is threatening retaliation. And thirdly, their own kinsmen, their own people are urging them to flee for safety. And folks, this is just a, a, a three-pronged attack of the devil, and the devil will use whatever voice he has to use to stop people from doing the work of God. But I want you to notice here, if you notice back in the early part of chapter 4, when, when Tobiah said, well, if a fox goes on the wall, he'll break the wall down. And, and Sanballat says, are they going to do it in a day? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they offer, asking all these questions. And we saw that that news, those reports, those sayings had traveled back to Nehemiah. They traveled back to the builders. And look what it, the effect that it's had. It has caused those who are doing the work. And they're at the halfway point. They're almost there. But it's caused them to just say, we can't do this. They've already built it halfway. They've already got it there. But the workers are becoming infected with unbelief that God will not finish what He has started, even though the wall was already halfway finished. Instead of celebrating what God had done, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy grace I've come, instead of doing that, they begin to despise and to look down upon the work of God. Hey, I had a similar experience like that not long ago. Um, uh, when I was in the middle of my degree at the seminary and things were tight, and things were tough, and it was just a lot of work, I looked at Katrina and I said, you know, I'm done. I'm going to get this degree and I'm done. I'm not going to go any further. We've been planning that I would go on and earn my doctorate. And she sat me down and she said, no, you're too far into this now. And uh, I got a good talking to, so I'm going to finish my education because my wife is going to be mad at me if I don't do it. <laughs> but, uh, but... But the point was that, you know, you, you, know you, you tend to get weak, you know, especially at the halfway point. That's when the devil likes to strike. Let's look how far into this you are, you know. Briggs Road, I don't have to tell you. If you've ever built buildings and you've built buildings, you've been there. You've been to those points where you say, oh, goodness, can we ever get it done? Will it ever be complete? And then here comes the song of the enemy. And we begin to doubt and, uh, and disbelieve. As I told you, the shoe salesman went to the town. I've used this illustration a number of times, but I like it so much, I get a lot of mileage out of it. You know, the shoe salesman, some of you have heard it, but some of you not. The shoe salesman goes to the town, and, and he tries to sell shoes. They say, we don't wear shoes here. So he goes back home, he's defeated. The second shoe salesman comes in, and he, they say, well, we don't sell shoes. We don't wear shoes here. He calls back to the home office. He says, send a truckload. They're not even wearing any shoes. I can sell a ton of shoes here. And it's the same thing. You come to the problem, and, and how do you look at it? Do you look at it as, here God has brought me, or here God has left me? The children of Israel did the same thing. When they were in the wilderness, and they were on their way to the promised land, and they began to grumble, rather than say, God has freed us from Egypt, He has liberated us, and He's leading us to a new land, they begin to say, oh, here we are. If we'd stayed in Egypt, at least we'd had cemeteries to bury our dead in. And, and folks, it's not a matter of perspective. This is not power of positive thinking. This is either unbelief or faith. 
This is not some think better and your circumstances will change. This is either we're going to trust God and trust His Word and trust His power, or we're going to disbelieve God and bring shame on His name. And folks, I'm telling you, churches are closing day by day every day because people have failed to believe the promises of God when He said He would build His church. So number one, they're infected with unbelief. I want you to notice, secondly, the enemy is threatening retaliation. The enemy knows that fear paralyzes people, but now you hear the enemy comes, and they say they'll not know. We're going to come in. We're going to surprise them. We're going to shock them. We're going to come in and kill them. We're going to kill them, and we're going to stop the work. We're going to see that this is all talk. We're going to see that there's no power behind their words. Primarily because the king of Persia had given them permission to build the wall, and the wall was going up at the wishes of the king of Persia. We always need to remember that the king of kings is, is behind our work, and he supports our work. And these other people here, they're going to come under the wrath of the empire if they do what they're threatening. So we're going to see that their threats are just wind. But folks, remember this Satan is a defeated foe, and he can do no more harm than God permits. Now it's a long chain he's on, but he is on a chain. Okay? I want you to understand this. The devil and God are not locked in some kind of equal cosmic battle, you know? You know, I see these little things on Facebook people share sometimes, and they're just so hokey. And let me tell you, if your faith is bound up in sharing a Facebook picture, you need to rethink your faith. But there's a picture, I've seen it, and it's got a picture of Jesus, and it's got a picture of the devil, and they're arm wrestling. And it'll say, you know, share, you know, and Jesus will win. If you don't share, the devil's going to win. That's totally bogus. That's totally insane. God and the devil are not locked in some battle of the ages and, and we're wondering who's going to win. We serve a sovereign God, and the devil is a defeated foe. And even though the devil works us ill, he ends up a servant of God unknowingly. When he raised up the pilot, and he raised up the Jews, and he raised up those to crucify Jesus, that was the work of the devil. And the Bible says the devil entered Judas. But what did it do? It placed Jesus on the cross as the propitiation for sin, whereby the victory would be won. And so even though the devil is our foe, he is subservient to God, and we don't fear him, we fear God. The enemy's threats are but wind. But I want you to notice probably the worst area of discouragement. You know, it's, some, it's easy to deal with you know, people just getting disheartened. And by the way, these words that they're saying, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing, etc., etc., there's too much trouble. In the, in the language, that's phrased in the form of a rhythm of a song. And so if it, that had turned into a song. They were going around just singing this song about how they were not going to be able to finish. And, you know, it just it had turned into, you know, instead of songs of praise, they were literally singing songs of defeat. It's... You can deal with discouragement. You can kind of pick yourself back up. You can even deal with the enemy. Man, if I have an enemy that comes against me, I can steal myself against them, and I've just got enough grit. I'm going to let you into a little bit of my constitution, folks. Never underestimate my refusal to go to bed and feel like a coward. When I go home at the end of the day, I want to look my wife in the eye and feel like I've been a man and I've stood up for what's right. And I'll tell you, I'll fight till the, till the end to be able to sleep at night and feel like I have obeyed my God and served my conscience and played the man. Never underestimate that. I've learned it the hard way that I don't want to live like that. And so I can steel myself against somebody that comes and, and wants to shut down the work of God. I can, I can do that. But I'll tell you what is hard. These Jews were building the wall. The enemy has railed. But then their own people, their own kindred come to them. And they, out, of, out of concern for their safety, they come to them ten times. You need to come home. This is too much. The enemy's going to come. They're going to kill you. Oh, you need to come home. But they didn't come once. They came again and said, we're worried. You don't know what you're getting into. You better come home. You better come home. You better stop this. And sometimes well-meaning advice can lead us down a wrong path. There have been many people that God was calling to step out in radical faith and say, follow me. Maybe a family member, someone who loves him and says, no, don't do that. 
Parents, if your child comes to you and says, God's calling me to the mission field, it might be hard for you to do. Of course it is. We were called to live a cruciform life, a life that conforms to the cross. But you, if you're a Christian, you need to reach down somewhere and you need to pray and pray about the will of God and don't just say, no, I want you to stay here and keep my grandkids real close. That's of the flesh. That's of the flesh. And if God is calling your children to go and serve, you need to give them to the Lord. That's a Christian response. The other is not a Christian response. And folks, never in the interest of immediate safety or immediate comfort dissuade someone you love from doing what God has called them to do. Don't play the part of Job's wife that looks at Job and pities him and says, just curse God and die. Now, she did that out of pity. She did that out of concern. But she, she, her priorities were misaligned. I heard Charles Stanley once preach. And he told a story. Charles Stanley's a great man of God. And he told a story. He said one time he had a couple of parents, a, a, you know, a family, mother and father come in. And they said, Dr. Stanley, we'd like to talk to you about our son. And they came in and they said, now, Dr. Stanley, you know that our son is in pre-med school. He's going to be a doctor. And he want, and, and, and we're paying for this and we've got big plans for him. But he's just come to us and told us that he believes God is calling him to be a pastor and he wants to quit and go to seminary. And they said, we want you to talk to him and talk him out of this. And he looked at those parents and said, you've lost your mind. You've absolutely lost your mind. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? See, that's of the flesh. That's of the devil. That's of this world. That's carnal. That's earthly. God places His hand on someone and says, I want you to serve me. And He's done that to all of us to some degree. We need to serve God. We need to serve God. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When you're going with Him, He goes with you. Fear paralyzes, but faith mobilizes. Secondly, I want you to notice this. Not only resist being immobilized by discouragement, but secondly, remember God and the souls of other people. Look at verse 13. So in the lowest parts of the space, here's how they respond. How do you respond to all this discouragement? Here's how Nehemiah responds and how the people of God respond. In the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah went from being a governor to being a general in an instant. And read that again. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I'm ready to go fight after reading that. Who wouldn't be? You see, folks, God calls His leaders. And if God calls you to leadership, He calls you to lead. He doesn't call you to average out the wills of the people and strike some, uh, you know, uh, lukewarm medium. God calls you when people are discouraged, but you're doing what's right. He causes you to raise the affections of the people of God. To steal the confidence of the people of God in what's right. It's natural for people to be discouraged when they see danger, when they see threat, when they see these things. But Nehemiah's call as a leader was to stand before them and place the God of Israel before them. And to raise their confidence and to raise their faith and to build their faith. And to place them on the right track. We don't, we don't run over someone or, or, or co you know, condemn someone who maybe their faith stumbles. But the Bible says we restore them in meekness. Someone's weak in the faith, the strong are to bear with them. And so God calls some people in His church to be leaders who will build up the faith of those who are failing. We're going to have sheep that are short-legged sheep. We're going to have sheep that are, that are weak and failing. We're going to have sheep that are going to not, mis not understand. But God calls leaders to raise up and to build people up and to bring them along and say, we are together and we are with the Lord. And we're going to remember the Lord. And that's what Nehemiah does. 
But I want you to notice here, I want you to notice the couple of things that he does. So now he, he stations the... And it, will be, it would be foolish to just totally disregard a credible threat. And it's difficult for people to work if they think they're going to die that afternoon. So, so Nehemiah responds, but notice he places... So we're going to see the work stops temporarily. The work stops temporarily so that they can mobilize the people as an army. So Nehemiah goes from being governor to general, and the workers go from being laborers to soldiers. And so, but notice what he does. What you see here in the book of Nehemiah is an example of cold warfare. That's what this is. He stations the army. So they're hearing reports they're going to come. And so Nate. Nehemiah stations the army in the open places where they can be seen so that people around will see because they've got spies going back and forth. That's how they're communicating. You see this, and it'll be revealed as we go through so that people say, oh, did you see Jerusalem over there? I mean, they've got soldiers over there, and you can see them up on the hill. Nehemiah's a city, um, shoot, Jerusalem's a city on a hill. It, it's geographically high. And so people around there would say, have you seen? Oh, they're not, they're not fooling around. They're serious. They've got their army stationed there. They're ready for attack. So that's all traveling back to the enemy. That's all traveling back. But I want you to notice this. Remember God who gives courageous faith. Nehemiah was signaling that they were ready. He knew it's important to face the enemy. Nehemiah knows this, that perceptible fear would be blood. It would be blood in the water and poison in the well. It would be blood in the water and it would be poison in the well. It would attract the sharks and it would poison the hearts of the people. And so he says, we're just going to face the threat. We're going to face Satan. We're going to face his minions. And we're going to stand in the power of God. And he says, remember remember God who gives courageous faith. Now notice this. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. So remember God who gives courageous faith. Man, look at that. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. We can do the work of God not because we're great and talented and skilled. We can do it because we serve an awesome God who promises to build His church. And he says, remember the Lord. What are we going to remember? Well, this this episode doesn't happen in a vacuum. This isn't just one thing that randomly happened. Remember, this isn't about one nation and another nation. This is about the fact that that in about 400 years, there's going to be a town in Bethlehem, and it has to be there. And there's going to have to be a city of Jerusalem. And there's going to have to be a lineage of David that survives for a Redeemer to come. This is not about two warring nations. This is about the redemptive plan of God. Satan works to destroy and disrupt the redemptive plan of God. And for the people of God to be successful, we've got to remember our history and God's redemption plan, and we've got to remember our future and God's redemption plan. Nehemiah didn't know all this, but he knew some of it. What did they have to remember? They'd have to remember that God was a covenant God who kept covenant with His people. The same God who called Abraham out of Ur. The same God who delivered the nation from Egypt. And this coming out of Persia is sort of a second exodus. They're coming out of Persia and coming to the promised land. They delivered the nation from Egypt. They fought against Israel's enemies. Uh, God fought against Israel's enemies numerous times. That same God is going to keep His promises now. We're not just mere humans trying to put together a social club or something of that nature. We are serving a great God who supports the work of His people doing the Great Commission. David was moved to action against Goliath because of his concern for the integrity of the name of God. David, I want you to understand, the story of David and Goliath is not about an individual overcoming their personal struggles. That's not what it's about. It's a story about a man who loved God and he fought for the glory of the name of God. Goliath was not David's personal enemy. Goliath was the enemy of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And when David went out there, he didn't say, oh, here's this guy that's been bugging me for years. He went out there and he said this, this uncircumcised Philistine shall fall like the lion and the bear. For he has defied the armies of the living God. I would to God that God would raise up people in his church like David that would be so concerned about the affairs and the interests of the living God in this world that they would make God's enemies their enemies and they would make God's mission their mission. 
David was happy as he could be keeping those sheep on the hillside, and he wasn't even sent to fight that day. But he went down there, and he heard this old pagan, uncircumcised Philistine blaspheme God, and he looked at the soldiers, and they were cowering, and he said, This cannot be. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. Jerusalem was the city of God. It was a place where God put His name. Now, God has put His name on His people, the church in this age. But in that age, that was where, the, that was where God dwelt. That was where His name was magnified. And for Jerusalem to be in ruins while pagan cities were thriving was an insult and affront to the name of God. I would to God that people would forget about their agendas and their opinions and their ideas and their thoughts and just say, I'm going to serve God and what God says we'll do. And if it means we've got to slay a giant, we're going to slay a giant. It's God's giant and it's God's battle. David did not say it's my battle. He said the battle is the Lord's. So God does not come alongside of us and help us to fight our battles. God calls us alongside of Him that we might fight His battles with Him. And when Satan opposes God's people, that's not our personal struggle. That's the story of God working out through us and our enemies are God's enemies. So the Jews needed to remember their history. Not only, not only David, but Moses and his parents when the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said, we're going to kill all the Hebrew males. Okay? And his parents said, we're not going to do that. Hebrews 11 says when he was born, his parents hid him because they saw that he was beautiful, he was a good child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Okay? Moses himself inherited that self-same courage. When he became of age, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You see, you're going to displease somebody in this life. The trick is, just displease the right one. You're either going to displease God, or you're going to anger the devil. And you're going to upset someone with the way that you live your life. And the thing is, you've got to defy the right one. Hebrews 11, though, gives us a catalog of people. Same, same chapter. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. You don't do that with some milk toast, lukewarm heart. You've got to do that with a red-hot devotion to the God of the Bible. And you go on in Hebrews 12, and the writer says, this is an example to us. We have a great cloud of witnesses that we may run the race that is set before us. In this similar way. And folks, the church of the living God today has reason to possess that same boldness and courage in our mission. Why? Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's two things to notice there. The gates of hell will come against the church. But they will not prevail against the church because Jesus promises to build His church. We need to expect the gates of hell. We need to expect the devil. But we need to know and have confidence in the Messiah, the Lord, the King who builds His church. What about churches that shut down? Sometimes there's a lot of factors that go into that. But I can tell you by and large, a lot of the reason that go in that is they cease to be a church. They either lost the gospel or they lost the mission. Jesus doesn't build a community club. He doesn't build a family clique. He builds His church. And when people come together under a building with a steeple, you can call it what you will. But when we forget to evangelize, we will fossilize. When we forget to evangelize, we will fossilize. If when we lose the gospel, we lose everything. And when we capitulate to the world... In areas of gospel, in areas of mission, in areas of who God's called us to be, we cease to be a church and Jesus ceases to build. But however, not only does He promise to build His church, 
Matthew 28, when he gives the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And he says, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Same wordage, same verbiage that comes from Joshua 1.9, I am with you, be strong. And what Jesus is doing, we don't have time to do a lot of the background, but he's actually keying in as Joshua. He's on the mountain. He's died. He's resurrected. He was a Moses. Then he died. Now he's Joshua. Sending the people out to the nations to conquer the nations with the gospel, just as Joshua was sending the people of God to conquer Canaan. And he says, I'm with you. I'm with you always. When we do the work of God, Jesus is with us in a special way to be with us to ensure that it's done. I grew up in church and we used to sing a song. Perhaps you know it. I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you know that one? No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Have you heard that one? I think George Bev Shea used to sing that a lot in the Billy Graham Crusades. That's a simple little song. We think of it as a children's song. And you might sort of think, well, that's sort of light fair. In the 1880s, there was a Welsh missionary who ministered in India in the province of Assam. And his first converts were a husband and wife, and they had two children. And this was a hostile area to the gospel. They captured the entire family, husband and wife and two children, they bound the wife, and they bound the children, and they bound the husband, and they looked at the husband, and they said, if you don't recant Jesus Christ, we're going to kill your wife and children in front of your eyes. And the report said that when he was asked to recant, that the man said in his tongue, I have decided to follow Jesus, and there is no turning back. They killed his children first. He said, the world can be behind me, but the cross is still before me. And they killed his wife. And after his wife was dead and he was left alone, he said, though no one is here to go with me, still I will follow Jesus. I think it's a good song. It got back to the missionary that won him to the Lord. And he wrote it into his song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And that song has gone the world over. Even in death, even in persecution even in martyrdom jesus builds his church paul says in all these things even in death in sword and persecution we are more than conquerors through him who loved us our enemies a defeated foe he just sends us to heaven early and builds god's kingdom on the other side of glory when he slays us he just perfects the work of sanctification in us and prepares us for the coming kingdom and the glory that lies ahead but I want you to know something else. Remember others who depend on your courageous faith. Not only remember God, but notice what he says. He says, remember the Lord. But he says, fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. If they had said, we got the wall built halfway with the enemies coming, you know what we got to do? We're threatened. We just got to stop. Let's go over here to these other cities. You know what happened? Sanballat and the Samaritans would have come down and they would have leveled that wall right back down. And the Jews would have just been consigned to just live as pilgrims and strangers here and there. Or worse, they might have actually been captured and enslaved. But for the people of this nation to give up and to succumb to the enemy would have been to consign their children and their children's children to be strangers and sojourners without a place to live and it would be to give up on building the name and the city of God in the world. It's not just their immediate fate in the balance here. It's the souls and the lives of those who depend on them. And folks, it is not just us who has stake in Briggs Road Baptist Church. Your children, your grandchildren, their children need a place where the gospel is preached, where the mission is central. This community... People are dying and going to hell. Sometimes people say this, well, I hope my church doesn't grow very big. I like it the way it is. You need to repent. You're wrong. You know, you're not just misguided. You're, you're, you're speaking Satan's words. Who are you going to go into the community and tell them they have to go to hell so your church can stay small? 
You pick them out and I'll go with you and let you tell them. Then I'll rebuke you and I'll tell them the other way. Let me tell you something, folks. God builds his church. God builds his church. And for you to make statements like that, for us to make statements like that and say, I want things to stay my way and I don't want it to grow, we're consigning people to hell. That's exactly what you're doing. Because if people get saved, what are we going to do? We're going to baptize them. We're going to make them members of the church. We're going to put them in a small group. We're going to fill this sanctuary up. And hopefully we're going to have to go to two services. That's what lies ahead. It's not a matter of growing the church so that I can speak at conferences and be well known. It's not a matter of growing the church so that we become a popular space. It's a matter of rescuing men and women and boys and girls who will go to hell tomorrow if they don't have the gospel today. And so to be a coward, and to be a coward and to succumb to the devil, and to average out the wills of the people and to strike a milk toast, lukewarm medium sacrifices the mission of God and consigns people to an eternity without Christ. Folks, the eternal destiny of approximately 7 billion people on this big blue marble depends on the faithfulness and the obedience of God's people to God's mission. When Timothy was struggling with his faith, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. That connects it to what we're doing here, the offspring of David. We're talking about David's people here. For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And Paul says this, Therefore I suffer everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul says, I'm sitting in this cold, damp jail cell for one reason. Because there are people out there, God's elect, that God is calling to Himself who need to hear the gospel, that they might be part of the church and part of the people of God. He says, I'm willing to go to jail. I'm willing to die for those who need the gospel. And many times, sadly, we have people that are not willing to adjust their routine for people who need the gospel. God, give us repentance. God, give us repentance. And as a result of that, 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Remember, others depend on us following the Lord. Some of you might know this. Um, several years ago, a few decades ago, there was a lot of controversy in our, our denomination. So some of you may not be familiar, but uh, as Southern Baptists, there was a lot of controversy. There was a lot of liberalism in our denomination. Some of you might have known that. Some of you might not have. Some of our seminaries were very, very liberal. They, they stopped teaching the gospel. Uh, you know, they, they had given up. You know, they were... Um, uh, lobbying for homosexual rights and all of this and uh, abortion. They didn't teach the gospel. They believed that eventually everybody was going to be saved. This was stuff that was coming out of some of our seminaries and infiltrating some of our churches. The seminary that I graduated from, Southern Seminary, before it recovered under Al Mohler, was a very liberal seminary. Horrible stuff coming out of there. And it was widespread throughout our convention, Southern Baptists. There was a division. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this for a reason. Some men stood up. Notable men. Uh, Paul Pressler, who was a judge in Texas. Paige Patterson, who is a, now a seminary president. Adrian Rogers. Jerry Vines. Charles Stanley. Some of these men in our denomination were instrumental in leading a charge whereby our convention was recovered and people came back to believing that the, the Bible was the inspired Word of God and they led a work of reformation and it was hard work. They got to a point, we have six Southern Baptist seminaries. And folks, I'm telling you, as go to the seminaries, you'll go to the churches in many cases. Because what's coming out is what comes into the churches and it filters down. I'm telling you, it's important. And if our six seminaries... Three of them were just full-blown bad. And so 
They had a plan. They said, what we're going to do is we're going to sue for peace. We're going to give the liberals half. We're going to take half, and we're going to make the best of it. But that wasn't good enough. God had another plan. Today, all six of our Southern Baptist seminaries are conservative. They've got great scholars, people who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible, people who believe in the gospel, because some men wouldn't take no for an answer. And they said, no, we're going to take back what Satan has tried to steal. And they began to make the changes that were necessary. They began to reinstate trustees. They began to do the things that needed to be done. Why am I telling you this? Because it was hard work. It cost them a lot. There were a lot of threats. There were a lot of personal attacks. There were a lot of sleepless nights for some of these people who stood up for this. Paige Patterson said this. During the middle of that reformation and recovery of the convention, I want to read you this quote. He said, in the final analysis, we did not attempt a reformation movement because we thought it would succeed, but because we sincerely believed that we were right about the inerrancy of the Bible, and because we did not want to tell our children and grandchildren that we had no courage to stand for our convictions. He says, we didn't do it because we thought we might win. We did it because we knew we were right. Folks, and when it comes to the work of the kingdom, there are things to be flexible about. There are things to talk about. There are preference things. You know, what cup of coffee do you like? All of that, you know, whatever. But when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to the mission of God, when it comes to the identity of the people of God, it's not one person's opinion versus another. It's what does the Word of God say? And it's a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of doing what God calls us to do and those who disagree calling them to repentance with love and truth. We must maintain the Word of God. Now, thirdly and finally, I want you to know this. Continue the work in the midst of warfare. I'm going to read a sizable chunk here, but we're going to deal with it very quickly. Now, what do they do? Number, number 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, and bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carry burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. Yeah. Boy, doesn't this sound like desperate times? It's never desperate when God's in control. First thing I want you to notice from this, this section is this. The plan of the enemy amounts to nothing. Did you see that in verse 15? When the enemy saw it, and when they heard it, and they knew that they had heard their plan, God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Nothing amounted of what the enemy had planned to do. Our enemy is a defeated foe. Our enemy is a defeated foe. You can stand confidently on the Word of God and the work of God. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I've said it before, the person who can kneel before God can stand before anyone. I've mentioned it several times, uh, and it just happens to fit what I'm saying, but this is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was a man who uh, became tired of the hypocrisies in his day of the Roman Catholic Church. He became tired of the fact that the Bible was not given to common men to be able to read. And so he protested and he nailed his thesis to the door. And because he wanted to translate the Bible into German so that everyone could read the Word of God, and because he believed that there was much corruption that needed to be corrected in the church, 
the Roman Catholic Church brought him in as a heretic to try him. And they were calling him and said, we're going uh, to possibly execute you if you don't recant and if you don't repent and if you don't come back to what they would call the faith. I want to read you the words of Martin Luther when he stood before the Diet of Worms and he was giving his account and giving his answer. He came the first day and he said, I can't answer today. Let me pray and come back tomorrow. On the second day, here's what he told the empire, the Roman Catholic Church, and the local German government stood before them as one man, and he said this. He said this. He said, It is neither right nor safe to disobey conscience. I disregard popes and the papacy, he said, and unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I will not repent or recant. Here I stand I can do no other. Folks, we need people who will stand on truth that way. A few weeks ago, we sung a hymn. You might remember it. Some of you might not have known it very well, but it was A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That was written by Martin Luther just years after that. Here's what he wrote, one of the lines from that song. It's a 500-year-old hymn. You like old hymns? This is a good one. It's 500 years old. He writes this, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That's what Martin Luther said about our great enemy, the devil, when he had stood under threat of death and defied him personally. And the final thing, I want to say this, kingdom work is always spiritual warfare. Notice here, these people, even though they return to the work, they keep their weapon at their side. They're carrying their weapon, they're carrying their work in the other hand. Nehemiah's servants were divided half and half into workers and warriors. The leaders were stationed behind the workers. The burden bearers carried weapons in their hands. The builders carried their sword at their side. Nehemiah commissioned a trumpeter to trumpet whenever the trouble would strike so that everybody could rally. Half of the men held spears from morning till night. They made the men who lived outside the city stay in the city at night for a night watch. And Nehemiah and his men didn't even take their clothes off because they wanted to be ready for the battle. I want you to understand this. All Kingdom work is spiritual warfare. Never think that we're just a a group of people out here who are just trying to do better. You might say, well, I've seen our attendance go down. You know what you've seen? You've seen Satan assailing this church. You might say, well, we've seen times when the finances have been lean. You know what you've seen? You've seen Satan fighting against this church. You know what you might, you might say, well, Pastor, I remember when we had more young people and now we don't have them. You know what you've seen? You've seen Satan fighting against this church. And when we begin to make decisions and when we begin to pick up walls and to put them back in place, do you know what we're doing? We are open attack on the devil. We are declaring war and we're saying, devil, what you've taken away, we're taking back. What you've torn down, we're going to build up by the power of God. You might say, well, I remember when this happened and things were great. Yeah, that's wonderful. But you know what we've got to do? We've got to just build. And when you do that, the devil gets angry. When you do that, the devil tries to discourage. He tries to speak. He tries to work against. He tries to fight. But you have to steel yourselves against the enemy and put your sword on your side and get to work. God didn't call us to fight. He called us to work. But in order to work, we've got to stand in the faith armed with the armor of God. You see, the reality is that all kingdom work is spiritual warfare. We're not a social club or a business. We're the church of the living God. And everything we accomplish attracts the ire of our enemy. And Satan will do whatever and use whoever and do whatever he can to hamstring and immobilize believers who are on mission for God. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 
So as I close, to continue the work of God, to continue what God has started and to do it well, number one, don't be discouraged while doing the work of God. Know for whom you're working and know why you're working and stay at the task. Secondly, remember the greatness of God and remember the lostness of others, that people's eternal soul depend on and exist the existence of and the faithfulness of a local church. And also remember to continue the work even in the midst of spiritual warfare. Continue the work. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for the courage it gives us. And I pray today, Lord, that every believer in this room, as they have heard Your Word, have been encouraged, have been had their faith built, and Lord, we pray that we will place our hand to the plow and do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.